it um it would be great if someone could enable me so I could screen share. Um, oh, yep. they just did. Excellent, yep. great. So I'm going to speak for a moment and then I'm going to flip, flip on my screen so I can share some slides with folks. Um, I'm really honored to be here to speak to you. It is a fantastic program that you are initiating here and an exciting step forward for podcasting in Serbia. And I think that you can be a model for other countries um, as they and other and people in other languages who are looking to do some of these same things that you're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for probably about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and then at the end of that time, um, I will be happy to take questions. I often find that the Q&A parts are the most interesting for the audience and the most interesting for me. So I would ask that you hold questions until then. But if you want to, I'm not quite sure how we'll do it. Perhaps we'll put them in the chat um, and you can ask questions and we'll scroll through and um, be able to pick them out there. But I, um, I really enjoy taking questions from, from listeners so uh if or from participants so if you have them note them down and we'll make plenty of time for them there at the end so i'm going to screen share now um uh, i'm just uh, going to pop this up so i can see it um okay so you should be able to see that now i'm just going to be walking through there's not a tremendous amount of information on here but i wanted to make sure that i had the ability to, to share some visuals with you as well um, I obviously don't speak your language, um, but I could tell through some of the previous comments you were discussing some of the work that I have done previously. Um, I was on the original team that started podcasting at NPR in 2005, produced a number of well-known podcasts there and created the kind of uh, podcast editorial system that they have in place there now. After leaving NPR, I went to Audible, where I started a uh, original content uh, group there that produced a number of award-winning, much-loved podcasts uh, that came out of uh, that group. Um, and um, almost two years ago, I left Audible to start my own company uh, with my co-founder, Jesse Baker. Um, it is called Magnificent Noise, and we produce content for the New York Times, for ESPN, TED, and Esther Perel Global Media. And um, the latest uh, podcast that I have um uh is uh, uh called pin drop it just launched yesterday um with my friends at ted it visits a number of cities around the world to see how um ideas uh, uh kind of flourish and exist in those cities you're probably familiar with the iconic ted talks um this is uh really this series asks the question if a city was to give a TED Talk, what would the city say? And the debut episode uh, launched yesterday, as I mentioned, and is up. Uh, it's up Bangkok, Thailand, is the um, uh, uh, first city. Um, the second city, which is launching next week, um, is oddly Mantua Township, New Jersey, a small suburb in New Jersey. Uh, then we go to Nairobi, Mexico City, Oberammergau, Germany, Lima, Peru a number of other cities around the world during the course of the series. So it's really a fun, very different sounding podcast. And um, so people always ask what the new thing I'm working on is. And so that's what I'm spending my time with now. You may be listening to my dog in the background who is growling because she's not getting my attention. Um, so moving on, in my office, there is a, um, a poster that hangs in my office, uh, this picture. It's a gentleman named Iggy Pop, American uh, punk rock singer. A number of you may be familiar with him. Uh, I have had this poster hanging over my desk since 1995. Um, I just, when this album came out, someone gave me a poster related to it because I'm a big fan of Iggy Pop. And um, I just like this and I find it inspiring. I find him an inspiring person. And so it hangs down over my uh office. What, one of the um, things that inspires me most about Iggy uh, is his tenacity and his drive. Um, one of the smaller things that I find really fascinating about Iggy Pop is Iggy Pop hates broccoli. He thinks that broccoli is the most disgusting substance that has ever existed. And Iggy uses that broccoli as a way to inspire himself to do great things. 
And so he uh, um, is known to ask that broccoli be put into his dressing room before a concert so that he can uh, then throw it in the trash can. Um, there's a couple of videos online of him performing with broccoli strapped around his neck. Um, he uses proximity to the thing he hates uh, to inspire his creativity. Um, and I have my own version of Iggy's head of broccoli. And that is Richard Branson, uh, the tech mogul um, and business mogul. Um, I have nothing against him as a person. I'm sure he's a very nice guy, but I have seen him be a guest on, usually as a guest on probably about 30 different podcasts a year, and that's not an exaggeration. Um, he is on, uh, uh, he is um, on so many podcasts, and the reason he's on podcasts has much more to do with uh, the podcasts are an easy venue for him, where he's not really asked um, uh, a bunch of hard questions, and he um, uh, uh, gets these, these, these. So he does a lot of these podcast interviews, and every time I see a podcast pop up where he's a guest. I always ask myself the question, why is he on this podcast? And what is he saying on the 30th podcast that he didn't say on the other 29? And the truth is, is that he isn't saying anything different. He's just doing more of the same. And I think that as a creator, just doing what everybody else does is really incredibly boring. And I um, uh, don't, and so I try to keep that picture of Richard, and I'll show you what my desk looks like in my office. Uh, you'll see uh, here we have uh, Iggy Pop, which hangs above my computer monitor. And over here is my little tiny picture of Richard Branson, um, which is there as a reminder to make sure that the work um, that uh, I am doing uh, does not fall in that category of being the 30th version of something that has existed 29 times before. And so I think that it's really important for new podcasters, even established podcasters, to take this kind of an approach of, in a world that's packed full of podcasts, how do I create something that is distinct? How do I create something that is only me, that is unduplicatable, because I am literally the only person who could put this together and make this happen? So with that in mind, um, uh, I would say that uh, let's let's go through some numbers that are incredibly important for podcasters. Um, there is uh, the number one point one, the number one hundred, sixty eight point six, twenty three thousand and one. Why are these numbers important? Well, each one of them indicates the state of where podcasting is right now uh, uh, internationally. There are currently one point one million podcasts available today. 1.1 million. Uh, they are available in 100 different languages. There are 68.6 million episodes of content available. There are 23,000 new podcasts available each week, which is a staggering number, and 10x where it was just a little over a year ago. It is because podcasting has become so easy. So many new tools are available to make, to let people become podcasters, that podcasters are coming, you know, literally there's a new podcast every 30 seconds. 1% of those podcasts are economically viable, only 1%. And by economically viable, I mean that they make enough revenue the, to uh, support one full-time person's salary and the costs of producing that content. And it, the shocking part is that number is going down. If I recalculated that now, it would probably be half of 1%. And it's just because so many new podcasts are coming in. So if your goal with a podcast is to create something, there's a couple things in these numbers that you need to keep, you need to remember. First, you are in a room full of 1.1 million others. How do you create something that's distinct? There are opportunities in every language, but there's a ton of content available how do you find creative white space that can cut through this? And if you're doing this as a hobby or something that's fun, great, fantastic. Podcasting is great. But if you either need to have resources to produce your podcast 
or this podcast is going to require so much of your time that it needs to become part of your professional life, then uh, 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 it needs to, um, uh, you, you're in a very rarefied space if you're able to make that work economically. It's very hard. And almost all podcasts do not hit that mark. And the answer to um, a lot of these questions is just finding something that is unique that you can do that nobody else can do. Literally nobody else can do. We'll talk about some of that. So when you look at globally, a lot of people I've spoken to um, in, in some of the press things I've done for your events um, and have been really concerned about how podcasting is doing internationally. So let's take, take a and and how, how it's doing in the course of this pandemic. So let's look at a couple pieces of information. The first is that uh, podcasting is a percentage of those who listen to a podcast in a month has grown dramatically, dramatically. Um, in the United States, just two or three years ago, that number was about half of what it is today. So in order for, in, in the United States, a country of 350 million people, to basically double the number of people who listen in a month has been, is, is kind of phenomenal. And almost all these other countries you see listed here also saw similar growth, if not more. You see Spain, uh, which is number two on this list, but is uh, probably in Europe is by far not only the um, where the largest percentage of the population is listening to podcasting, but which has also developed a pretty substantial ecosystem to support it by advertising listeners, kind of communities that kind of, you know, people write about podcasts or talk about podcasts. It's really ingratiated and ingrained itself into the media a landscape there in Spain in a, in, in a way that you just don't see much outside of the United States anywhere. Uh, that South Korea uh, number is um, uh, probably, uh, uh, it, 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 so podcasting in Asia is, is very different than what podcasting is in English speaking countries and in European countries. Um, it is much more, podcasting is much more uh, uh, all forms of audio spoken word entertainment, things that almost sound much more like um, uh, audiobooks, things that sound much more like instructions or, or those type of things. All those uh, um, go into what the bucket of what is considered podcasting in many Asian countries, including South Korea and China. So, um, uh, you know, the interesting thing is if you look at this list, now these are the leaders, obviously. There's quite a few other countries that will be represented here. It is not a expansive study, so not every country is going to be um, uh, acknowledged in this. So, you know, like for example, Serbia is probably not going to show up in a, in a SERP sample like this of 2,000 people, um, but uh, these other countries do. And and you see that you know there's at least four countries on this, if not five countries on this list that are English-speaking countries. And up until recently, you saw that. The, the great mass majority of podcast consumption and podcast creation was happening in the English language, most dominated by the United States, but emerging for Canada, United Kingdom, with Australia, New Zealand, and other countries coming up behind. But you have seen a democratization happen in podcasting globally and in different languages. These things, they, they, they go in parallel. Uh, um, and uh, for example, where I expect this chart to change significantly is if you look at countries like Germany, which on this list, before podcasting, if you look at radio, you look at audio drama, you look at spoken word in general, has had a much more robust um, old media presence for spoken word. And so over time, I see Germany probably rising to close to the top of this list. But you'll see more countries in more, more, um, uh, languages. As I mentioned earlier, there's three real components that you need for podcasting to succeed. There has to be native language, local content that's created. Uh, there has to be an audience that's interested and able to listen. And there has to be an economic incentive system, either through advertising or through direct listener contributions. And the important thing is in every one of these countries, the audience was there first, the content was there second, and the financials were the lagging third. And so 
uh, that will, I think, continue to rise. I think also as you continue to see Spotify becoming an increasingly um, important presence in podcasting, if not positioning itself to becoming the dominant um, provider of podcasting, um, the, uh, uh, the in that realm, uh, you will see podcasting become even more relevant in more countries faster. If for no other, other reason than uh, the balance of Android to Apple uh, uh, phones, uh, smartphones, uh, is much more democratized in, in the rest of the world where you see much more Android penetration. And uh, podcasting has not really had a leader in, auto, in the Android space for providing podcasts. And so many people listen to Spotify that it's just a natural extension of that. So I think you'll see that continue to move. Um, another question that people um, uh, uh, have asked quite a bit lately is, how has the pandemic influenced podcast listening? And um, it has influenced podcast listening to what I think is a fairly great extent, um, uh, but a very short-term extent. So, so one of the, the most significant things that's happened in the pandemic has been the kind of removal of commuting times, where people who are working from home now are not commuting into the office. They're away from the house much more, much less often. And those were drivers of um, uh, podcast consumption away from the home. So with those activities removed, the podcast consumption goes down. Now, what this chart is, is it looks from the beginning of this year. So this is just 2020 and goes up to about a week and a half ago. And this is just in the US, but I would suggest that you're not going to see radically different uh, behavior in other parts of the world. I don't know if you can see my mouth, point, mouth pointer, but uh, the mouth, around the, the, this point here is January 1st. Um, and, uh, uh, and you'll see that even though podcasting has had tremendous growth in previous years, uh, as 2020 was starting, you saw just a rapid rise, oh, year over year podcast growth, 20, 30 percent. The red line is download growth, and the uh, much I think much more important number is the the aqua blue green number here, which is um, uh, you know, the uh, uh, audience, the number of people listening. And what you saw is, you know, when it was at its peak here, you were seeing 30 plus per 20 to 30% increases in audience and in um, downloads since January 1st only. So just in a matter of two or three months, you're seeing this huge growth here in this year. And then as the pandemic starts to kick in, you just see things bottom down. And note that even as they, they started to come apart, we have never seen less listening than we saw on January 1st. So for the entire year, if this was a stock being purchased on a stock market, you would never have lost any money if you bought it on January 1st. Because even when it went down, it never went back to zero. And so you do see some drop off in listening, but mostly based off of uh, that absence of commuting and absence of out of home activity. But then you start to see this rapid rise again, which is people trying to figure out what new normal looks like. And I think that uh, this is um, an indication that people are turning to podcasting more than just as a companion while they walk the dog or commute back and forth to work. They're really using podcasting as a way to, um, to be connected to the world and be connected to other people. And even in a pandemic, that doesn't change. So I think that um, the important lesson here is that while there's been a lot of disruption in the world and a lot of disruption in media, podcasting has seen itself kind of find a way forward, even in this kind of crazy time. So I think that there's, um, there's quite a bit of optimism uh, that uh, uh, you, can, you would see here. Um, and so, Briefly, you know, as we return to, so things are not falling apart. That's a good thing. Uh, things are growing globally and continuing to, to, to improve around the world. But you still have this glut of content with a new podcast every thir you know, 30 seconds. How can you find a place in that world? And what the, when I sit down with people to talk about po making podcasts, 
And I, uh, whether it is an individual who is, um, uh, who is, uh, you know, I'm talking to in a coffee shop, um, a friend of a friend who's thinking about starting their own podcast, or it's I'm talking to a major media company about their plans for podcasting. Um, I always start with the same question, um, which is, if there's 1.1 million podcasts available today, why should there be 1 million, 1 million, 100,000 and one? What do you have to say that's unique? What do you have to say that isn't being said? What do you have to say that is missing? How, in a very crowded place, how do you find some white space where you can occupy? And even though it seems overwhelming that 1.1 million competitors that you can find something that is yours, that you can own, uh, that seems impossible. And it actually isn't impossible. It's not, may not be immediately apparent to you, but there are many ways that you can find something. You know, people worry about competition. I don't worry about competition. I spend my time worrying about how do I create something that somebody else can't do? And that's where I put my effort in. And that doesn't mean that it's expensive or takes a lot of time or costs a lot of money to make. Often a clever idea is something that nobody else has thought of. And that you know, one of my good friends is producing a podcast called Everything is Alive, in which he pretends to interview inanimate objects like a, like a, um, a can of soda or a gas light or um, um, uh, other things in the world. And he has conversations with actors who pretend that they are that thing. And they're hilarious. And it's the most original, interesting idea and well executed. And it doesn't cost him much money to make. And he's actually able to do it as a full-time job because he's uh, figured out how to make this fun podcast. So it doesn't take a lot of resources. It doesn't take a lot of money to be successful. It just takes a great idea. And so how do you answer some of these questions about white space? How do you know what is your podcast? Well, I'll tell you a story. I, um, uh, it, often when I'm giving speeches, um, I have historically said, oh, you know, um, I, uh, you know, everyone seems to have a podcast these days. Every politician has a podcast. Every actor has a podcast. Even the yoga instructor down the street from you has a podcast. And um, I've always kind of made that line. And I, I actually take yoga classes. And um, uh, probably about a year ago now, I was in my yoga class. And my yoga instructor came up to me at the beginning of class and said, um, uh, I need to speak to you after class. And I first wondered, okay, what, what yoga faux pas did I just do that requires me to um, uh, be talked to by the, uh, after the class? Um, if, and uh, so I, um, uh, after class, I went up to him and said uh, uh, that I would um, uh, be happy to talk to him. So what do you need to know? And he said, well, I'd like to... Uh, I, everybody keeps telling me that I should have a podcast. Could you help me figure out what that is? And here's my joke about the yoga instructor down the street having a podcast actually coming true. And uh, so I started talking with Joe, and um, I realized that you know Joe is not a media professional. He's a he's a life coach and a pod and a and a um, yoga instructor. He doesn't understand. And most of the people I talk to are media people. So I had to find a way to really kind of translate this idea of finding creative white space uh, into um, uh, into uh, uh, something that uh, uh, he could understand. And, and by the way, I want to reiterate, just in case you are, I see there's a couple comments coming in. Um, there's a Q&A feature. If you ask your question, um, I will uh, answer them when I get to the end of my uh, time here. It's probably going to be the most efficient way for us to do it. So if you ask a question in the Q&A feature, I will go through them when I'm done with my presentation and answer them. Um, so if you want to get yours in, get it in now. Um, so what I did is I ended up talking to Joe and I, I, we actually, I had a piece of paper in front of me and I sketched out um, a little diamond shaped thing and put a bunch of points around that diamond. And I said, Joe, there's a couple questions that you need to answer. You need to answer, and I wrote down them, you, why, and what. And I actually, as I was talking about them and answering him 
what these all meant and what they meant. I kept on the piece of paper drawing a circle because I was trying to make the point that these things are all interconnected. And I will walk through what all these mean. But they're all interconnected. And so I ended up eventually just deciding to make it a circle with four points on it. And these are all um, uh, the points on those. And these answers all kind of work together. And the questions really are though, you, what, them, and why. Are you, who are you? Who are you? Who are you as the character, uh, the host, the producer of this podcast? What are people getting from you? Uh, what is what do you have to say? Them is who are you speaking to and why? What reaction do you want to provoke? And when I come up with this, I actually do the hierarchy of them on top and you on the bottom uh, purposefully because the audience is the most important thing. The audience is the beginning and end, the alpha and the omega of this process of uh, if you would like, uh, you know, what is the most important thing about your podcast is the people who listen. They are the people who make it worthwhile. They provide you with the support and love and encouragement that you need to continue. Their presence is what will attract advertisers and potential partners. It's like everything you do to serve them is the right answer. If whenever you have any question about your podcast, does it benefit the listener? If the answer is yes, then that's probably a good indication you should be doing. So, so that's why they're on top of the circle. You are on the bottom. And the reason you are on the bottom is because most people mistakenly think that this pod, that when they make a podcast, it's all about them. Now, making a podcast should be fun. It should be rewarding. There's an awful lot in it for you. But in the hierarchy of, 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 uh, of the, the podcast creation process, you are the least important thing. You are an important part of it but it is not about you. And so what you want to do is uh, think of uh, think of you accordingly, that, that the, the audience is the most important thing and you are, are, are perhaps the least. So looking at what all these things mean, let me walk through them and give you an idea. The first, whenever I sit down with anyone to have a conversation about a podcast, I really ask the them question first. And before I ask about format, before I ask about who the guests are, what even sometimes even specifics on what the subject is of the podcast, I'm like, who are you trying to talk to? Tell me who the audience is for this podcast. And the, almost universally, the first question I get is, um, oh, it's for everyone. I want everyone to listen. And if that's the case, if you think your podcast is for everyone, then your podcast actually is for no one. And uh, the uh, podcasting is a world of niches. Po even a podcast like This American Life or Invisibilia or TED Talks Daily, which have millions of downloads, The Daily, um, they have millions of downloads, but they are still niches. They are just huge niches. But podcasting is about niches, being about something and talking to a specific group of people. And so you have to define who you are talking to. If, for example, you are creating a podcast about beekeeping, and you is that might seem like, oh, I'm making it for beekeepers. That might seem like a definition of who you're speaking to. But in reality, it is... So what kind of beekeepers are you really speaking to? If you're speaking to people who have been keeping beehives for 20 years, that's a very different conversation than a podcast that is targeted at people who are just now uh, getting involved in beekeeping for the first time. Two different conversations. Which group are you speaking to? And again, if you think you're speaking to both groups, you're not really speaking to either of them because they're feeling an absence when you're not talking to them. So it really is getting incredibly specific and defined of who are you talking to, thinking of the demographics of that group, thinking about what their issues are, what, what, they're, what, they're, what they're looking for out of the podcast. And very importantly, think about your podcast as what problem are you solving for them? Because every good podcast solves a problem. Every good podcast solves a problem. The problem can be, I don't know something. The problem can be, I'd really like to laugh. 
The problem could be I don't understand my local government. The problem could be that I love this this hobby and I want to hear from other people so I feel less connected. The problem could be that I feel alone and I just want to feel hear from people who share my worldview. So that is really the most critical thing. And 98, 99% of the people I talk to, when they sit down, they're like, I have an idea for a podcast, and they have never spent a minute answering this question. So I think it's really an important thing for you to, to consider. The next one on this list actually goes counterclockwise is what? What are you trying to say? What do you have to say? What are you so passionate about saying that you're willing to give up your time to create a podcast? What is it that um, you want to say to the world, to say to the them, to that group of people, that you believe in so much that you're willing to put your time into it? What is your message? What do you stand for? And this becomes important because not only because to understand what you're what you're trying to say, but as a way for people to understand in this sea of choices, 23,000 new podcasts in a week, why would you be an interesting thing to listen to? And again, being incredibly specific in this time is very important. Um, answering what is not just saying my podcast is about the future. Um, the, uh, that's a great idea. It's about the future, but it's not specific enough. If you are a person that thinks that the future is full, is, is a place where we have solved disease, cured cancer, we all have jet packs, we can teleport around, there's no poverty, uh, no war. If you think that's your version, vision of the future, that's fantastic. It's a very different person, very different podcast than one who's being made by a person who thinks that the future is scary, dystopian, and frightening, and that what is going to happen is bad. Those are two different podcasts that supposedly are both about the future, but are completely different. So spending more time thinking about what you have to say, what is your message? What is your perspective? What is your take? That I think is, is, is a critical amount, uh, a critical thing to be paying attention to. Uh, another one on this list as well is the you. Uh, who are you? That may seem like a simple question, but uh, who the audience hears and understands, um, I think, is uh, and meets when they come into the podcast and having a very clear idea of how you fit into this conversation or this story is really critical to spend time with um, because it's one of the defining features of your show. In fact, it's often the thing that is uh, what uh, makes it so different. If you are doing a podcast about your local football team, that you love, there's probably already a couple other podcasts uh, that about that uh, football team, and there may be, um, uh, yet immediately one of the things that differentiates it is you. You are the one who's there. So how do you bring you into it? And you can be a bunch of different things. Um, for the, uh, like for example, I am a you know podcast producer. I am a, uh, I, I drive an electric car. I'm a father. I am a pet owner. Um, I am a resident of New Jersey. I am all these different things. I am a son to two elderly parents. Um, I bring a lot of things to that podcast. Which version of me is the one who's, who's in that chair? If you are doing a podcast that is focused on the local football team, uh, are you a longtime fan, a new fan? Um, are you uh, are you really analytical about coaching? Are you really into player stats? I mean, like, what version of you is sitting in that behind that microphone? And understanding who you are and what role you play is as important as what you're talking about, because the thing that really defines your podcast and makes it more distinct than anything else is you. Um, uh, and then uh, the uh, why. Uh, this is something that hardly any com um, <coughs> pardon me, hardly anyone ever thinks about is why are you doing this podcast? What is the point of it? If the point of it is to express yourself, that's great. That's art. That's not necessarily media. But if you uh, if you are um, trying to inspire people to take action, if you are wanting people to vote. 
if you are wanting to influence someone's purchasing decisions, if you want someone to be happier or more calm or feel more connected, all of those outcomes are really important part of the creative process of making the thing. If you know what you're trying to do, it makes making it much clearer as to what the point of it is. Um, I'm working on a podcast right now with Deepak Chopra, which is really focused on providing people tools of what they can do with their energy and time now in this time of crisis, things they can do, small acts they can do today to make tomorrow better. And I think that that is um, uh, really uh, uh, focused on trying to help people. So, um, uh, so these four questions are critically important. And if you are working by yourself, you can sit down with a piece of paper and write out these and answer these questions for yourself. And any amount of time you invest in it, if you have 10 minutes, if you have an hour, if you have three days to answer and think about these questions and really sharpen the answers, you're always going to do, um, it's always a good investment of time. So that four pointed circle of who you are, what you have to say, who are you speaking to, and what reaction do you want to provoke? Um, another thing I want to go through real quickly, um, and for those of you who are participating in the class that's happening next week, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about these things, but I'll offer a kind of a preview for you as to what we're going to be talking about next week. And for others, um, uh, uh, I will, uh, uh, for others who aren't participating, again, give you a summary of what it is, which is that when I've looked around at podcasts, so ones I consider successful and that work real well, and, and it should be important to define that success does not necessarily mean that it is getting millions of downloads and making a lot of money. Success can be uh, defining an audience and reaching that audience, regardless of the size of that audience. Um, if you are interested in reaching a bunch of people who care about this author or this period of time in history or this certain event, that may not be a lot of people, but the podca a podcast can be a very good way of reaching a specific group of people. And all the po podcasts that are successful um, have three basic components to them that I think uh, every successful podcast has, which is uh, story, character, and voice. Like I said, those who participate in the workshop next week we're gonna spend a lot more time on this, uh, but I wanna walk through what each of these means, story, character, and voice. Story is having a compelling idea, story or idea, which is everything has to be about something. Every good thing has a clear idea of itself and its, its identity, um, whether it is the answers to those four questions or whether you are telling a narrative story, but you have to have a very clear idea of what you're doing or what you're about. The second is an engaging character or host. Hosts are characters. If you are doing an interview or an uh, interview podcast or a conversation podcast, like it or not, you're a character. The, the people who listen to the podcast hear you. They hear you talking to people. They form opinions about you. They like you, don't like you, support you, don't support you, uh, wish you had done something else. They don't have a full picture of you, but they have a picture of you as a character in that podcast. And you need to understand how that works. And every successful podcast has, a, has an engaging host or, or character, someone for people to care about. If it's not the host, it's the guests on the podcast. If, it's not, if you're telling a story, that story is full of characters. And whenever telling a narrative story, you always focus on character. People remember characters first conflict second and data third. If I tell you that um, um, a troubled young woman um, was kind of caught in an airport, unable to travel home, and her flight was two hours late, you're going to remember that woman, and you're going to see a picture of her in her mind. You're going to relate to the situation she's in. And you might remember that her plane was late, but you'll never remember how, how long it was late. It's a data point. And I think that storytellers and podcasts and Almost all podcasts involve storytelling to some degree or another. Um, uh, uh, focus, often focus in the reverse order. They focus too much on data points, of like what happened and when, but they spend very little time thinking about characters and the situations those characters are in, 
even in news reporting and journalism. And podcasting, the podcasts that work, thrive on characters. And you have to create a character um, and, and really focus your attention on how that character changes over time. Um, I, we have a, um, my company has a podcast coming out next month, the New York Times, which is a very confusing, complicated story about a uh, wrongful conviction, someone who's in prison who shouldn't be. And even though there are tons and tons and tons of data points about the story, which are fairly compelling in a, uh, in a you know, kind of a, uh, um, uh, a you know, as, as, as facts, they are very compelling. What moves you is the characters in the story and getting to know them and understanding what they went through. And uh, so the engaging characters, I think, are a really important component. Um, and, and every podcast, nonfiction, fiction, conversations, interviews, whatever, has clearly defined hosts and characters. And the third is the unique voice. Uh, voice is a little harder for people to understand who are not, um, who are not used to making media. It's something you do accidentally if you don't do it intentionally, which is basically what's your style? What's your, what's your, your voice is like, what is your uniqueness? What is, when you are creating this podcast, uh, what really um, kind of works for you? Uh, what, what, uh, what, what does it sound like? What do you sound like? What's your cadence? What's your rhythm? What's your style? Um, and that unique voice uh, is unique to you. And it's not you imitating somebody else. It's not you trying to be somebody else. It's you being yourself and creating something that's a reflection of you. The most common problem people have when they're interviewing is they, uh, uh, they uh, try to be somebody else. They think of interviewers that they respect. It could be a TV presenter. It could be a radio host. It could be another podcaster. And they basically play act as if they are that person and try to present themselves as their version of that and try to do the things that they see that person do and don't really take the time to develop their own voice. And it is the single problem with interviewing and interviewers that if you could correct that, everyone would be exponentially better immediately. It is the largest problem that people have uh, in the creative process. And so therefore, um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very unique situation of, uh, um, uh, uh, wanting to wanting to, to do your own thing and end up actually sounding like somebody else. And the people who win are the people who create their own distinct voice. And again, those of you who are participating in the uh, class next week will spend a lot of time talking about this and talking about it really as it applies to your own projects. Um, and with that, we'll turn to some questions. Um, there are in both the Web chat and the Q&A, there are questions. What I would suggest is if you have questions, probably the Q&A fe feature is probably easier for me to, to, to navigate. So um, uh, there's a, I'll answer one right away. Are you a Bruce, uh, a Bruce fan uh, because I'm from New Jersey? Um, I've only lived in New Jersey for about four years. I grew up in the state of Ohio and then lived in Washington, D.C. Um, but I, uh, I have been a Bruce fan for many, many years. Not a crazy Bruce fan, but um, I have admired him. And uh, Asbury Park, which is very uh, central to the mythology of Bruce Springsteen, is only about 40 minutes from my house. And we go down there a couple times a year just to hang out. So that's great. Um, so let's, uh, if you, again, if you have other questions, please put them in the Q&A feature. Um, Jack answer, ask the question. Metrics are very different when we look at different regions. Uh, what we know from research, maybe we are wrong, is that for the U.S., a successful podcast is 10,000 listens. Downloads per episodes are considered as such. On the other hand, last year's Podcast Day conference in the U.K., a successful podcast in the U.K. has over 170 listens, downloads per episode. Can you give uh, other world stats averages? Well, I, I don't think that there's any answer to this question at all. Um, let me turn off my screen share so I can see you all and then you can see me and I will uh, um, stop sharing and that we can, um, I can answer your questions. Um, uh, so the, 
I think that you, the definition for success is very different on different platforms. Uh, if you are, um, uh, for example, if you are uh, um, uh, a major publisher who's spending uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to create this podcast and are um, is part of your outreach strategy for your um, your brand, uh, you should be having many more than ten million or ten thousand podcast downloads uh, in order to be successful. Um, a TED Radio Hour, something that I created when I was at NPR currently gets about 12 million podcast downloads an episode, which is kind of crazy huge. Um, but it is, uh, that's a measure of success that works for them. Um, if you are creating a podcast that is targeted at people who live in your town or your neighborhood or are fans of a team, um, that's not going to be measured by 12 million downloads a month. It's not going to be a million downloads a month. It may not even be a thousand downloads a month. But when you figure out what your definition of success is, um, I want to reach people who live in my town. I want to reach people who are fans of this book or this football team or whatever. I want to talk to people who are also interested in this hobby. When you do all those things, um, you find that your measure of success is pretty easy to establish from there. It could be dozens, it could be hundreds, it could be thousands. So looking again here, another question. Um, uh, one of the pain points for podcasts uh, is analytics. What are your thoughts? Uh, how best to track them, uh, how to track them best? Um, there are not a lot of data points available. If you are distributing your podcasts through Apple Podcasts or through Spotify, both provide some incredibly rudimentary um, uh, uh, data and that's about what you get and uh it mostly is confined to downloads uh which don't mean necessarily mean that people are listening to those downloads it just means they're downloading it um and uh also uh in addition to downloads uh usually a completion ratio or how many people that downloaded it actually finished it which is a pretty good data point to have um uh, there's, uh, you, you, you do uh, ask yourself, uh, what, why isn't there more? And the answer is because they are um, uh, uh, a lot of privacy concerns between the providers and you. Also, data has value and people are hesitant to give it up because uh, they figure that they want to control the relationship with the audience and their data. Um, and also podcasting was originally built to be a very open democratic system. Uh, and uh, that, uh, therefore, there's not a lot of user information that's gathered. It's, it's meant to be open and accessible to all and uh, free. And uh, as a result, there are not a lot of those data things available. So let me um, look here. Uh, let me go. Uh, where should a budding story, audio storyteller look for stories? Any tips from uh, Elijah? I would say that, um, yeah, it's what are you interested in? What, what really fascinates you? Um, what are you passionate about? What are you willing to spend time figuring out and kind of unraveling? And uh, if that fascinates you, uh, and it, it probably fascinates other people, um, one of the things I commonly do when I am working on stories is I uh, will sit, sit down with a friend or talk with a friend and say, um, let me tell you this story that I'm working on or that I'm fascinated in. And I ask them uh, what, uh, what um, and I watch them while they are listening. Like, what are they, where do they tune in and tune out? What are they interested in, not interested in? Um, and it tells me about the story and teaches me how to tell the story. And I do that over and over and over again. And uh, therefore, I can learn better how to tell the story. And it tells me if that's a story to tell. So I think, it, how do you find good stories to tell? Like, what fascinates you? That, that's, that's basically it. You can learn a lot of skill about being a podcaster, but you can't learn how to be curious. You have to be kind of curious on your own and find a way to make uh, curiosity work for, your, for you. Um, okay, so... Uh, pain points analytics. Okay, let's see. Uh, we've done that one. Let's see. Excellent presentation. Thank you. 
uh, next place is so congrats and well that's not a question but i really appreciate you saying that nice thing um uh let's see uh we will contact inspire speech from you long live podcast be public well great i'm glad you are inspired by podcasting uh anonymous attendee uh in the session before yours there was a short discussion on podcasts and independent journalism and their financial sustainability uh it was said that an ideal financial model is 100 percent audience supported but we see big ones globally that are leaning on sponsors and ads what's your thoughts on it? a mix one or the other depends on the region uh, uh let's see um i think that anyone who relies on one source of revenue is leaving themselves in a kind of a precarious situation that you um, can find yourself um, if that, like, for example, here in the United States, there's a lot of money flowing to ads for podcasting and therefore people are very dependent on that advertising money. Well, you know, we have seen with the global pandemic that there's that's become a little rocky. What if that continues to become rocky? It's hard to understand how you can support um a podcast based off of uh advertising when advertising gets shaky and perhaps the rates go down the income comes goes down uh that can be devastating if you however are in a position where you are um supporting yourselves a number of different ways um there are basically four ways that podcasting can be paid for one is advertising sponsorship the second is listener sensitive revenue, which is any dollar that comes from a listener. Uh, the third is derivative rights, which is selling material, the IP in your podcast to become a book or a TV show or a movie or, or whatever, right? Um, the fourth is institutional funding, where someone is basically paying you to make this, a, a grant making organization, a company, whatever. So it, one of those four. And, and most podcasts basically have one source of, of, of revenue. And the smartest podcasters are those who have two or three. And uh, because as one goes soft, uh, you have the others to lean on. When advertising goes down, your listener contributions and your um, perhaps your derivative IP are all things that, that can help sustain it over time. So I think that it isn't as much that this is the right way, this is the wrong way, it is a mix that really kind of makes it, it uh, um, workable. So let's see, a couple others. I'm gonna answer questions just for about another five minutes and then we'll be done. Uh, how many minutes, hours of recording have you done uh, for 30 minutes of final audio? That's a very interesting question. Um, I'm assuming what you're meaning is how much audio do you record to get 30 minutes of finished material? Um, I think that is, uh, depends on the show. Um, there are some shows where you, you know, I, I think there's no world in which you record 30 minutes to get 30 minutes. Um, I think because no conversation is completely, all entirely uh, works. Um, there are moments in conversations or interviews that, aren't as interesting, aren't as relevant, don't kind of land quite as well. And you want to be able to cut those out and leave time in your process to do that. Um, the second is uh, that um, uh, you should be able to take risks when you're recording a podcast. To ask questions that you don't know really where it's going to go, but you know you can cut it out later. And so therefore, if you ask the question, it doesn't work out, you're fine. If you ask the question and um, uh, you get a great response. Well, then that was worth that risk. So very little risk to 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 building in that extra time. Um, but if you're literally recording something and then putting it out in the world afterwards, that's a very dangerous way to to exist. Uh, uh, and then with narrative storytelling, that's even harder uh, question to answer. Um, for example, the series we're doing with uh, the New York Times. Um, it's coming out next month. It's a narrative story about this uh, 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 wrongful conviction. The, um, uh, uh, the, we did over 200 hours of interviews, 200 hours of interviews, and countless drafts and of, of, of the narration and putting it together with the music and everything. And that's to get eight 30-minute episodes out of it. So, that's a huge amount of work. 
Um, but when you look at some of the higher end narrow series, that's really what um, uh, what, what what it takes. So um, uh, I think it's, it depends. But the I, I, the the further your answer to get thirty minutes of finished audio, the further away from thirty minutes that your recording is, the better quality you're going to get. So if you build in an hour to get thirty minutes, it's going to be pretty good. If you build in ninety minutes, it's going to be much better. So you know it just really is a matter of figuring out what what works for you and what works to get the good material out. Um, and I'm going to do one more question. Um, uh, do you think that established media companies like New York Times and The Guardian make podcasts to make money or build brand? The answer is yes, they do both. And uh, they're very good at doing both because they're um, organizations that um, uh, have an established base in podcasting from which to grow from. So I think that's both. And maybe I'll answer one more. Um, uh, why should newspapers get into podcasting? Because that's where the audience is. Um, if you um, if you are a newspaper and you are just printing an edition of your newspaper, if you're just like you're a radio station and you're only putting things out on the radio, if you're a TV station and you're just putting out stuff on a, a, a TV broadcast signal, um, when you confine yourself to just that one platform, you're confining yourself to only the audience that will use that platform. And podcasting reaches other audiences, and I think that's what really kind of one of the things that makes it special. So with that, I'm I'm at time. So um, there are a couple of questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get through them all, but um, uh, I think that's about it. Okay, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yes. All right, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, this was this was fantastic, uh, and I and I really see that you know people enjoyed. There was a lot of questions and. Uh, I guess they will continue with the questions during uh, during the uh, next two classes that you will you will teach next week. Yes, uh, thank everybody for asking questions. Yeah, yeah and uh, we will we will switch to to Serbian now, so we will announce uh, the winners of of your book. That uh, yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, Eric. Thank you.